takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, through learning, teaching, and community building, and it's centralized within our Indigenous Initiatives Office. Good morning, everyone. My name is Charmaine Dean, and I am the Vice President, Research and International at the University of Waterloo. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this edition of Research Talks, curing the COVID-19 pandemic. University research has impact on everyone in our community, and at Waterloo, we want to share our research with each of you, engage in conversation, and hear your questions and thoughts. We believe strongly that society advances best when universities, as you know, this is the hallmark of the University of Waterloo, when universities connect to the community, to industry, to policymakers who are shaping Canada and the world. This is our first virtual research talks event. Really thrilled to have all of you here participating today. We plan to continue running research talks virtually and engage with the Waterloo community through these difficult times. We recognize the importance of incorporating ex uh, perspectives from across campus and from outside of campus, and we'll continue to do that in our research talk series. We'll hear thoughts through presentations, and they'll also be available to answer questions at the end of the session. We'll also be recording the session and plan to post it on our website as we've done with previous sessions. First, we're going to begin by asking each of our four speakers to deliver a short presentation about their work. We'll then take questions from the audience. And so I'll invite you to add uh, either a question, you want to state a question to the chat or put the question in in the chat. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a bit about the panelists who will be presenting today. Plinia Morita is an assistant professor at the School of Public Health Systems at the University of Waterloo. He also holds appointments as an affiliated scientist as, at Healthcare Human Factors, University Health Network, as a research scientist at the Research Institute for Aging, and as an assistant professor at the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Dr. Marita also holds a research chair, the J.W. Graham Information Technology Emerging Leader Chair in Applied Health Informatics. He's a leading researcher in the use of AI and IoT for public health and global health initiatives. At the UB Lab, his research team focuses on the use of big data and AI to improve current public health surveillance mechanisms and to support countries in the monitoring of health indicators, as well as environmental factors. Professor Morita's research team has developed large-scale data collection ecosystems for supporting local initiatives in Canada and um, in communities in efforts to better understand the impact of extreme air pollution on child and maternal health. He also looks at the impact of heat waves on, on seniors around the globe in partnership with Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada. Through the development of data ecosystems and AI solutions, his lab called the UB Lab has been pushing the envelope in the development of predictive models that can help public health officials around the world to better understand their data as well as creating real-time indicators to support risk mitigation initiatives. And these are aimed at minimizing the impact of uncontrolled urbanization and climate change on health. He holds a Bachelor of Engin Electrical Engineering and a Master's in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Campinas, Brazil, and a PhD in Systems Design Engineering from the University of Waterloo. Catherine Deland, we're so thrilled to have as an external speaker. She's an experienced senior level professional and has a cross-cutting background in law, in public health, in diplomacy, governance, 
and in biochemistry. He has 20 years as a professional in intergovernmental and nonprofit organizations, private sector and academia, and high and low income countries. In 2008, she founded the Land Associates, a firm that fills an identified gap in consulting, advising, and strategic services in international law, public health, and policy. Currently, she is the senior health advisor in the office of David Nabarro, the World Health Organization's special envoy for COVID-19 preparedness and response. From 2014 to 2016, she was the chief of staff of the World Health Organization's Ebola response. She worked closely with the governments of the affected countries, the United Nations Mission on Emergency Ebola Response, and numerous other agencies. She was also seconded to the Office of the Director General as part of the team that developed the approach to the World Health Organization's health emergencies capacity. Previously, Catherine Deland was senior advisor to the head of the Convention Secretariat of the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and provided expertise and strategic support to developing the joint World Health Organization World Bank Group Initiative, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. When it's possible, geographically, she lectures on global health governance at the University of California in Los Angeles and at the University of Southern California. She's a senior fellow at the Global Health Center of, Gra of the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies and a commissioner on the Lancet O'Neill Institute, Georgetown University Commission on Global Health and the Law. She's a member of the California Bar and she received a BA from Reed College and an MPH and JD from the University of California, Los Angeles. We're pleased to have an internal um, expert here as well, Heather Law, an assistant professor and academic director of the Economic Development and Innovation Program right here at the University of Waterloo. Professor Law Hall grew up in Northern Ontario and has a professional and personal interest in researching issues that are important to the North, including the impacts of new technologies on the future of work, innovation and economic development, policy planning and practice. Her work has been recognized nationally and internationally and has informed government policy in Canada, in Northern Ontario, in Newfoundland and Labrador, and in Sweden. Dr. Hall is currently a leading national shirk funded project, leading a national shirk funded project that's called Remote Controlled, exploring the impacts of new technologies in the mining sector. She's also leading a shirk funded project in partnership with the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, examining rural Canada and COVID-19 to understand economic development impacts and the responses that are needed for rural recovery. She's an Ontario Early Researcher Award recipient, a member of the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. She's chair of the Research Advisory Board for Northern Ontario Policy Institute. She's also a co-author of Planning Canadian Regions. She received a BA from Laurentian University, and an Emmy in Planning from the University of Waterloo and a PhD from Queen's University. And we're very pleased to also have here another external expert, Nick Ogden. Nick is a trained UK trained veterinarian. After 10 years of mixed clinical practice, he then completed a doctorate in Lyme disease ecology at the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford. During the six years he spent as a professor as at the Faculty of Veterinarian Science in the University of Liverpool, he continued his research into the ecology and epidemiology of tick-borne diseases of public health importance in Europe and those of importance to livestock production in Africa. In 2002, we were very fortunate he moved to Canada 
He received postdoctoral in disease modeling at the University of Montreal and continued research in the ecology of Lyme disease and other zoonoses and climate change as a research scientist at the Public Health Agency of Canada. As interim director of the Environmental Issues Division of the Public Health Agency of Canada, he directed a program on climate change and infectious disease risks and community adaptation to these risks. As director of the Zoonosis Division, he directed programs on no national coordination, surveillance, prevention of zoonosis, including Lyme disease, West Nile virus. He's now a senior research scientist and the Director of Public Health Risk Sciences within the National Microbiology Laboratory of the PHAC. He's leading a lot of the modeling that's currently in place with regards to the COVID response. And in fact, he's been leading the agency disease modeling efforts in this, in this space. So I'd like to welcome all of our four speakers, Peniel, Catherine, Heather, and Nick to Research Talks. Thank you very much for being here today. Love to have the mix here from the World Health Organization and the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we're going to invite each of the speakers in turn to present. We'll start with Plinio and then I'll invite Catherine, Heather, and Nick subsequently. And then we'd love to hear the questions from the audience. So let me pass it off over to you, Peniel, to tell you tell us about your research. Excellent. It will be a great pleasure. Just give me one second to transition uh, my slides on the screen here. Perfect. Okay, so let me share my screen. Oops, sorry, wrong slides, my apologies. Excellent. I don't see I don't see my screens, but can I get a confirmation that my slides are showing properly? We can see them in you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for for your time and thanks for attending this uh, presentation, this research talk session at the University of Waterloo. Um, my name is Plinio Morita. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems here at the University of Waterloo. Uh, while I'm an engineer by training, I've been working in healthcare for about eight to 10 years, uh, transitioning from mobile health technologies for chronic diseases when I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship. And now we're looking at the use of IoT technologies, so Internet of Things and mobile health in a pandemic. Right, so uh, our my research lab focuses on the broad use of these technologies in uh, public health, but in this presentation, I'm going to focus specifically on uh, the scenario that we are currently living in and the use of this uh, type of data in public health. So my research is, is, is found, founded on the intersection of public health surveillance and IoT and mobile health, and we look at the use of these technologies for understanding the impact of extreme events, as for example, extreme cold, as we're likely going to be seeing this year in Canada, we're also looking at the use of the same data for exploring heat, extreme, extreme heat events like heat waves in Canada and around the world. We have projects in which we're looking at extreme air pollution in uh, developing countries like Mongolia, for example. If we look at uh, the cases of wildfires as we had in the West Coast, that was another situation where uh, like technology as IoT and wearables played an important role in understanding population health. And more recently, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are using the, the same technology ecosystem to monitor population health. So before we get started, like the, the whole premise of my research program is around what we call public health surveillance. And for those that who, who are not in the field, public health surveillance is the simple concept of understanding population health. We're not monitoring the one individual, we're not looking at the health of that one person, but trying to understand the global impact of some of these events that I just shared on previous slides on the overall population health. 
So we're not, I'm not interested in how much you're sleeping or how much your neighbor is sleeping. I'm interested in how the entire population of Ontario is sleeping and how that how the pandemic has affected them. And we're going to get to that. We're going to talk in a few minutes. So in order to achieve that, we use wearables and IoT technology for this purpose. So the definition of wearables are basically anything that you wear on your body, right? So for example, like you can see two here that I'm wearing as part of some of our studies. Uh, those are devices that are filled with sensors that allow us to monitor a number of different health metrics. Some of these uh, sensors are capable of monitoring heart rate, blood oxygenation, uh, sleep patterns, physical activity. And then we come into the area of Internet of Things, which are what we call ambient sensors. So those are sensors that are built into the environment and that can be used for monitoring health and healthy health behaviors as well. To give you an example of a project that we're currently running with a company called Ecobee, which is the one that you see here on the screen, we are using their multitude of sensors to understand sleep patterns from users of this thermostat. So by using data collected from these all the sensors that are part of the Ecobee ecosystem, we're developing a layer on their, uh, on their technology that is able to provide health indicators to family members and other individuals. So <clears throat> this is an article that we published, uh, this I think was published last year, where we talk about the use of these disruptive technologies for public health in general. Uh, this was a, a small project that we had with Health Canada in which we discussed the application of some of these technologies that I'm talking today, as well as the use of artificial intelligence and blockchain in public health and environmental research. But in order for us to, the reason why this, is, this technology is so important in a pandemic is because we don't really understand the impact of COVID-19 or the overall population. We've been talking about people that get sick and that are uh, that end up going to the ICU and, and have severe, severe consequences of catching the COVID-19 virus. But on the other hand, we're forgetting about the hidden impacts or the hidden consequences of this pandemic. So for example, like recent, uh, earlier this year, there was a publication on the Lancet Psychiatry, uh, Psychiatry where they talked about the priorities for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And one of them was a call for action for mental health research, mainly because we, we are going to be seeing the real impact of this pandemic years down the road. Right now, we're just trying to cope with the, with, the, with the restrictions that we have, but the real, real effect of this pandemic will be seen like five, 10 years into the future. So basically, we, we decided to use some of these technologies to better understand our population. And one of the interesting aspects as well is how working from home has also brought new challenges to uh, individuals in Canada and globally. So we see here a picture of a mother working at home, like she has a decent setup with her computer on her, on her workstation, which is also taking care of her baby. She's also having to deal with other complexities in life that we're not accounting for. And this adds stressors to the, to the individual work and we're not a properly evaluating that longitudinal impact. And the last thing, the last uh, impact that is important for us to talk about is social mobility. So one of the interesting articles that we're working on right now looks at the use of what we call social mobility data that's being generated by Apple and Google, where they're looking at the mobility on your phone. So looking at the GPS on your phone, data from your phone, in this case from, from um, Google is using GPS data and Apple is using maps uh, query data to identify how much people are moving around. So the data set does not include any individual identifiers. So again, it's not a individual data set, it's an aggregate data set that tells you how each different city in the world that is part of their data set is uh, dealing with mobility. And what we identified is that there is a relationship between, a small relationship between the mobility data and the uh, number of cases uh, within these cities. So, in order, to, ultimately, we want to use this technology to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the population. And one very interesting study that was recently announced by Fitbit talks about the impact of COVID-19 on global sleep patterns. Let me be very transparent here that this is not a peer-reviewed study. This is a study done by 
Fitbit using their own data that they have on their, on their users. And what they identified was that over uh, on, the week, on the week of March 22nd, so that was right after the pandemic was announced and we had the lockdowns, we identified a deviation in normal sleep, normal minutes of sleep. So you can, if you look at this four charts here, you see four different age ranges. So 18 to 24, sorry, 18 to 29, uh, 30 to 49, 50 to 64, and 65 plus. And what can we identify from this? Is that the interesting trend is that if you are on the 18 to 29 year range, uh, age range, you're getting more sleep per week. So you can see that there was a positive change in the, num in the amount of sleep that you were getting. And then if you look at 65 plus, you had a reduction in the number of the, the, the minutes slept. Consequently, showing that uh, people at that age range were likely more concerned about the pandemic because they were one of the groups that were at risk. If we looked at the same data, but now looking at different cities around the world, you can also see the progression and in, in the, the change in number of, of sleep minutes over time between February, uh, February 9th and March 22nd, and looking at all the different cities in Europe that they were monitoring. But the beauty of this data is that it's already available. This is data that Fitbit already has on their servers. They have 30 million, of, million users worldwide, and these insights can be easily generated through this data. But however, one of the challenges that we face is data access. Like this is often hidden behind, this data is often hidden behind corporate walls that prevent re public health researchers from using this data because that data was not collected for the purpose of informing public health decision making. So unfortunately, these studies are, are, can be done by Fitbit and their employees, but this data is not readily available for public health researchers to use. So for this reason, we have explored other venues to understand healthy behaviors. And one of them was through our uh, ECOB data set that we mentioned. So why did we choose this specific thermostat for a study? And the main reason is that there are over 1.4 million thermostats in the market, all of them collecting data, mobility data collected from the white sensors that you see on the screen there. So these ones here, each of these sensors is composed of a, thermo a thermometer and a motion sensor in it. And with this data, we're able to quantify levels of physical activity inside the house, sedentary behavior, and sleep quality. So that's the power of the data. That's why we have decided to use this product in our, in our research. And they also have a very unique data set called Donate Your Data, where they provide you access with to 1,500, sorry, 115,000 unique data sets, all anonymized that we can use for research. So what have we identified over by looking at some of this data? So in here, you see four heat maps representing data from January 2020, February 2020, March 2020, and April 2020. So in March, moving to the next slide. So this is the regular uh, pattern for this specific household. So you can see that in the morning. So you, at the bottom of the chart, you have the beginning of the day and at the top as it gets later in the day that's where the data is so you can see that in the morning this person is getting ready to leave for the house you have absence of, absence of sensor activation during the day so that person is likely working out of home out of, out of the house and then they come back later in the day to enjoy their home and that pattern sustains from january and february and march but then when it comes to mid-March and April, you see a variation in that pattern. The density of activation gets much higher, representing the fact that this person is now working from home. So this is a, a study that's a, a, a variation of a, an article that we recently published in the use of this, tech, this ECOB tech, uh, sensor technology for public health surveillance, where we were looking at sleep patterns on this larger data set. But ultimately, what this all these data sets provide to us are in a, an already available data set that can be used to inform public health decision makers. All that we have to do is work with the companies and work with the developers to create a, a solution on top of it that can be used by public health researchers and, and officials to make uh, this informed decisions based on this information. 
lastly, the, the last thing that I wanted to briefly touch on is the uh, use of contact tracing and contact notification apps. Uh, if you are in Canada, uh, COVID Alert is the approved app that our government is using. And the interesting thing about these solutions is that they provide a very pervasive and cost efficient solution for contact notification. They are like everybody carries their smartphone in their pocket. However, these apps around the world are being severely underutilized. And for a number of reasons, like many of these apps were rushed to the market because we had this big demand for contact notification apps. And consequently, the developers of these applications did not spend enough time doing proper user center design, properly understanding what their users' interests are and what their needs are. So ultimately, what these, all these applications have to do is go back to the drawing board and upgrade their, the design of their solutions to up optimize the uptake and ensure that more users are downloading and reporting their symptoms. Uh, another another application that we have been working with is called COVID Watch, where we uh, we provided the guidance uh, on how the public health system in Canada uh, differs from the U.S. as they were uh, originally designed for. And uh, we also tried to deploy this in Canada, but at that time the Canadian government decided to go with COVID Alert, which was a solution developed here in Canada. So ultimately, this is this is what I had to to discuss with you about uh, public health, uh, public health and IoT technologies in Canada. The idea being that technology and data are available. If there is a multitude of sensors that can be used for public health to inform public health decision making. However, the biggest barrier that we face today is data access is getting our hands on this data and being able to use it for for uh, informing public health decision making. I would just like to thank some of our project partners that have been involved in this in these initiatives here and some of our uh, funding agencies that have supported our research and uh, I'll have I'll be open for questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for Neo. We'll save questions for the end. And so Catherine, very pleased to have you join the conversation now. Hi, um, it's my pleasure to be here with you all. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, I, I do not have a big slide presentation. Um, I, so what I'm going to do instead, and I think this is because uh, with enormous uh, respect to the to Vice President Dean, who I know is a statistician and, and Dr. Morita, who I think is a, a, an engineer, um, although I normally deal in data, I think what what I've been asked to talk to today and what I would really like to talk to you all about today is about how to build trust and to do community engagement. And I think it's to do that. One of the things we have to do is actually talk to each other. And so I'm going to not use slides and I'm going to talk to you, talk to you and see and see how that goes. Um, it also is more sort of uh, for me fitting with with how I think this this conversation should be and, and what we're trying to do with with David, my boss. A little background on me. I know I got an introduction from the from Vice President Dean earlier, but I think the most important thing is that I have worked in the field in public health for a number of years. I, I love it. I love working with students. I love working with communities. I think the most important thing we can do as public health experts and specialists is to reach out to communities and make sure that what they are getting is what they need and not what people think they need. So I was I was thinking about how to begin this talk with you all, and I thought maybe I would talk about the thing that nobody wants, <laughs> which are lockdowns, and maybe we can move back from what nobody wants to what everybody wants, which is to have a life that at least feels a little bit more normal. And the way we get there is both by some really good public health science, but also by an enormous amount of social science that has to do with building trust, engaging with communities and being present and listening to people. So let's start with lockdowns. Lockdowns um, are something that both WHO and I think in general, the public health community would say are a very last resort. They are not what anybody wants to use as a primary tool to manage outbreaks. The way that we manage outbreaks um, uh, is, a, is a well known epidemiological process, uh, depending on the virus or depending on the pathogen, of course, 
But what we need to figure out in terms of COVID in the context that we're in today is what are we not doing in, in the epidemiology that leads us to continually having to do these lockdowns, which nobody wants? How do we get out of meeting lockdowns? So maybe we start with some of the, the public health. The public health uh, in terms of respiratory virus control is pretty clear. And to be fair, it's, a, it's also pretty clear. It's what we used for Ebola. Um, there's not, it's not a complicated process. The, the first part is what we all call find the virus. And the way you find the virus is you either use a test that is reliable or you use less reliable means like identifying symptoms. And the reason that's less reliable in the case of COVID, of course, people are presenting with symptoms that can be confused with colds or flus or all kinds of things. The symptomology is quite broad. Um, with something like Ebola, it's in very easy to confuse with malaria. It, you know, the, there's sort of multiple diagnoses for this. Um, so, the, but the first job is to find the virus. If you have a test, use all the tests you can. If you don't have tests, then let's use symptoms. Once you know where the virus is, controlling an outbreak becomes quite a lot easier. Then you can isolate people with the virus so that they're not spreading it any further. And if they weren't isolated when they first got the virus, you can find their contacts and ask them to isolate. If they don't get the virus, that's great. If they do get the virus, they then need to wait until they're clear of the virus. Now, all of that sounds like a very logical progression, and it is in terms of epidemiology. What's not logical is how we really get people to engage with that and behave that way. Because it turns out that finding the virus with tests and isolating and all that is one thing, but what you really want to do is keep the virus from spreading to begin with. And the way that we accomplish that is behavior change. And this is the case with any kind of pathogen you can think of. The behavior change in something like measles is everybody getting vaccinated. The behavior change with something like HIV is using various treatments that are available or, and, and of course at the beginning was you know, safe sex using condoms. Behavior change is at the heart of managing outbreak control. But behavior change is really hard for people. I always give this example when I when I talk to people, and I might have you might have heard this before from me or from others. But um, you know, I can remember when the U.S. introduced seatbelt laws, and at the time, my 80 year old father was very very resistant to even that kind of behavior change, which was so clearly aligned with both protecting himself and and others around him. Um, like us from being devastated, which should he be in an accident, but it, you know, convincing people to change their behaviors is, is one of the hardest things we do in public health. And so maybe the next step that I wanted to talk about, and I'm mindful that we're already at, at, uh, 20 past the hour. Um, so I don't want to go on for too long, but the way that we get people to change their behaviors. And in this case, it's about wearing masks. It's about socially distancing. It's about using cough hygiene, it's about washing your hands, it's about being willing to self-isolate when you have been exposed or you think you've been exposed. The way that we get people to do that is by building trust and engaging in communities. And the way that human beings, I think, operate uh, with each other is that the more we are open, the more we are transparent, the more we are accountable to each other, the better we are able to communicate and believe what each other are saying. So I, I think that um, the best way to talk about building trust in community and community engagement in terms of changing the way an outbreak is moving is to maybe use some examples. Um, and people use lots of words when they talk about this. They use things like local and adapted and contextualized, but it's hard to really imagine what that looks like if you don't use examples. So let me give you a couple of examples from my experience working in the field, and um, maybe we can translate those through your questions or later into uh, some, some bigger messages that might be useful to think about. Um, so, you know, when we first started responding to the Ebola crisis in West Africa, one of the things we really struggled with is that um, there are some basic tenets about Ebola that are really hard. 
you know, it's 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 not a, a very aggressive virus in terms of how it's spread. You really do have to be in contact with somebody to get it. So it's not aerosolized. It's not something you can pick up on the bus or things like that. But um, once you have it, it's of course devastating. And so one of the things that we had to do was really talk to people and families where if, for instance, your child got sick with a fever, if they were febrile, uh, we had to ask parents not to hug febrile children. We had to ask husbands not to hug their wives when they were ill. We had to separate people and isolate them. And those kinds of things are incredibly difficult. And I think quite a lot of the challenge that was faced early on was a, an awareness of the science of how Ebola was moving around, but a lack of awareness of how the community needed to hear the messages about how to slow that down. So one of the things we learned slowly as it, as it was, was to bring in, and, and all the people in the social sciences, I, I will hope will be glad to hear this, but one of the things we really learned was to value enormously anthropologists. We managed to find four or five anthropologists from each of the countries in question, that was Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, who spoke a bunch of the local languages, were very familiar with the culture, were from there originally, and to really get inside of communities. And once we were able to communicate in a way that conveyed trust and, and, and engagement with them, really the job then is to hand the response over to the community. It's, it, it is the community that is gonna take ownership of it and it is the community that's gonna be able to run that. That isn't to say that they don't need support and tests and public health and, and infrastructure and money, that's not that. But the way that you move towards collectively resolving an outbreak is to have the community take ownership of it. And the way we did that in West Africa was really to bring a bunch of anthropologists who were able to engage fully and, and let us share the messages that the science gave. The next example maybe I'll give, and it's one that is sort of old in public health circles, and so perhaps everybody's heard of it, but it's one that I really like to use when I talk to people because I think it, it highlights um, how important trust is. When they were working on polio eradication in, Ni in Nigeria, one of uh, a bunch of people that I know were involved and there was a whole group of people who were very concerned that the vaccine that was being distributed was a part of a miscommunicated effort to damage the Muslim community in Northwest and Northeast uh, and Nigeria. And it took, it was, it was a, a very hostile moment in public health. They were very angry and I think the public health people were very concerned and probably also angry. There was a lot of quite hot uh, emotions. And then a couple of really insightful people came in and realized that the answer was to figure out how to create a vaccine that would be acceptable to this community. And so in broad conversation with the religious leaders, the community leaders, and all of the people who were involved in Nigeria, what we ended up doing was starting to manufacture polio vaccines in Malaysia and Indonesia, places where they were, uh, you know, Islamically run, Muslim run uh, vaccine manufacturers, and that calmed an enormous number of the concerns, and suddenly that whole issue was cleared. And of course, that had nothing to do with the science of the vaccine or the outbreak control, but everything to do with hearing and listening, <coughs> engaging and being present. And I think the last thing I wanted to mention before I hand over to the next speaker is, <coughs> pardon me, one of the things that we're really seeing more in COVID than I think we've seen anywhere else, um, probably both because it is so long running and also because it is so global, is what the WHO team are calling infodemics. This is the misinformation. There is so many channels of uh, social media, so many channels of uh, basic internet, you know, everything that's out there. And there's so much information. It's really hard to filter what's reasonable or unreasonable. And, you know, just people, want to hear what feels better to hear and people also want to hear what matches with what they all already believe and so i think there needs to be a real sort of thought given to and the people at who people on my team people that i know 
are enormously invested in trying to figure out how to speak to people about the infodemic, about some of the misinformation that's out there, and figure out how to uh, really connect with people and give them an opportunity to say their piece and be engaged in a really useful conversation about how to control COVID. So those three examples, bringing in anthropologists, changing the location of the vaccine, and looking at a lot of the misinformation that's out there and trying to unpack why people are so attracted to it. I use those as, as examples because, you know, there's no, <coughs> sorry, I'm not sure what my problem is. <laughs> there's no, um, there's no outbreak. There's no big public health crisis that hasn't faced challenges. And at the heart of each of those challenges has really been to engage with the people and engage with the communities. And once we do that, it's not a question of how to get the science right. It's a question of how to get the people right. And I think if we do that, and we do that in a way that's humane, compassionate, and thoughtful, then you protect the vulnerable, you think about the people that need your uh, the attention most, and you really begin to get at how to control the outbreak. And then you start to see successful outcomes. Um, I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. I know we have a couple of the speakers who have super important things, and I don't want to run out of time. So thanks for, for that, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all. It's been really a pleasure. Catherine, really interesting perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker, Heather, and then come back, Catherine, with some thoughts. Thank you for the introduction, Charmaine, and thank you for inviting me to be part of such an important and timely panel. Since April, I have been working in partnership with the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation to understand the impacts of COVID-19 on rural communities across Canada and the responses needed for recovery. SURF is a charitable foundation that was created in 1989 to contribute to the revitalization and sustainability of rural Canada through collaborative research with rural leaders in the community, private sector, and all levels of government. In April, SURF launched a survey to learn more about the impacts of COVID-19 on rural Canadians. The results indicated that people were most concerned about how their communities would be resilient, and in some cases, even survive the current crisis. And they were unsure about the steps needed for recovery. The survey results also revealed that rural Canadians were interested in learning more about how other communities were responding to the impacts of COVID-19. As a result, SURF formed a Rural and COVID-19 subcommittee, created the hashtag COVID-19 Rural, launched a, series, launched a COVID-19 Rural Resources page on their website, and created a Rural Insight series on COVID-19, which to date has published 18 reports on key issues impacting rural communities, from economic recovery to mental health, long-term care, infrastructure, and broadband. As part of my work with SURF, I co-published a Rural Insight report on su supporting rural recovery and resilience after COVID-19, and I'm leading a COVID-19 SHRC Partnership Engage grant to explore the impacts of COVID-19 on rural communities across Canada and the responses needed for recovery. This includes a rural impact scan for each province and territory, and a national survey with rural economic development practitioners to understand the economic development impacts and responses to COVID-19. To date, we have had 78 responses from across the country representing a diversity of rural communities. Since March, people in rural communities have been impacted, have str been struggling with unemployment, uncertainty, fear, and competing demands over work and providing childcare and family care, which is not unlike the experiences of people living in cities across the country. However, one of the biggest impacts on rural communities has been access to broadband. As many of the social and economic aspects of our daily lives have been pushed online to mitigate the risks of COVID-19, we have rural communities where students cannot connect to virtual learning, where employees cannot work from home, where people cannot connect to virtual medicine, and where small businesses cannot transition to online sales because there is no or limited access to broadband. This is not a new issue for rural communities, but COVID-19 has certainly shone a huge spotlight on the digital divide that exists in this country. We know that many of the sectors that rural communities depend on were impacted and continue to be impacted by COVID-19. The agricultural sector, for example, has experienced a number of challenges from labor shortages to interruptions in supply chains and markets. 
In the mining sector, many remote mine sites were initially on care and maintenance, while others were operating at reduced activity levels. They have also had to restructure their fly-in, fly-out work arrangements and invest in mobile rapid testing on site. The tourism sector, which is built to so many rural communities, has had to shift to local and regional markets, promoting staycations and stay home year due to international and provincial travel restrictions. Throughout the pandemic, we have also seen a sudden interest in rural communities as a place to escape and access rural assets like affordability, space, and natural amenities. While this interest in rural has brought opportunities, it has also created a lot of tensions from fear of the virus being brought into rural communities to conflicts with seasonal residents, as well as overcrowding at beaches and other rural amenities, with some tourists ignoring both local and provincial health orders. With regards to small businesses, our survey results and other studies show that they've been impacted by COVID-19 in a variety of ways, from revenue losses to increased expenses related to COVID-19 health and safety measures, to layoffs as well as supply chain issues, overproduction, and permanent closures. But some businesses have also experienced opportunities, including increased sales, new markets, new products, and new partnerships. It's important to understand that the impacts of COVID-19 are really deepened in rural communities because of their unique socioeconomic context. Rural communities often have smaller populations, which means they have a limited workforce and a smaller tax base to be able to respond to challenges like COVID-19 and there are larger distances to markets, services, and healthcare. Economic activities in rural communities often tend to be seasonal, like agriculture, fishing, and tourism, and there's a reliance on a smaller number of industries or sectors. This means that the closure of even one small business in a small rural community can have a huge ripple effect through the entire socioeconomic fabric of that community. When we start thinking about recovery and resilience, it's important to remind ourselves that many rural communities across the country have a long history of responding to downturns in their resource-based economies. While each downturn is unique, previous economic recessions do offer important lessons for dealing with the current crisis. In our Rural Insight Report on Supporting Recovery and Resilience, my colleagues and I argue that there are four lessons we should keep in mind. First, communities across Canada will all experience the crisis differently. Degree of remoteness, economic mix, and the level of community capacity will demand a level of sensitivity in policy and program response, which often prevents a, presents a considerable challenge for senior governments. Previous experience also informs us that governments often provide targeted support like sector-specific emergency funds or stimulus funds to specific industries during a downturn to protect jobs and investments. However, this support does not always translate into direct benefits for workers or communities. A third lesson is that quick shovel-ready projects may inadvertently waste opportunities for critical investments in 21st century infrastructure. Previous experience has shown us that quick investments usually tie rural communities to dated and costly long-term infrastructure. Communities also have different levels of capacity to meet shovel-ready project timelines. Many communities and regions are well prepared with good community and economic development plans. However, previous experience has underscored how many lack the capacity and the resources to complete feasibility studies or prepare plans in advance of funding opportunities. And finally, municipalities and regional governments will struggle with maintaining critical services and infrastructure. This is especially problematic because if these services close, people leave and the impacts on the local economy will be deeper. Related to this is the need to maintain qualified and experienced municipal and regional government service staff who often experience job losses due to budget cuts and austerity measures. Programs to support and maintain human resource capacity during and after a crisis response is therefore essential. Based on our survey results, many rural economic development practitioners felt unprepared to deal with the impacts of COVID-19, and that is certainly understandable. Much like our lessons from previous downturns, some respondents indicated that their economic development budgets have been cut or reallocated, while some communities have also experienced layoffs and redeployment of their economic development staff. This will make planning for economic recovery in those communities particularly challenging. That being said, since April, we have seen rural businesses and rural economic development practitioners respond to the impacts in a number of innovative ways. These include businesses like rural distilleries in Saskatchewan and Nova Scotia retooling their operations to produce hand sanitizers, farmers in Northern Ontario turning to direct marketing to consumers via social media, and chefs and restaurants in the Yukon and Nova Scotia assisting food banks and nonprofits with meal preparation. 
At the community level, economic development initiatives have included economic recovery task force, by local campaigns, business tax deferrals, creating new business funds, assisting small rural businesses transition online, and changing bylaws and zoning requirements to encourage outdoor shopping and expanded patios. Some of my favorite examples from the survey include, in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, they created the Moose Jaw Virtual Marketplace for local businesses to sell their products and services. They also had a ding dong ditch day. And for those of you who are not familiar with this phrase, it is a tradition or a game where you leave something preferably nice on a neighbor, family member, or friend's doorstep, ring the doorbell, and run away. In Moose Jaw, Ding Dong Ditch Day had people order products from local businesses that were then delivered to recipients' doorsteps. Minto here in Southern Ontario worked with a number of partners to create the Locally Loyal Minto campaign. It including printing $2,000 in Locally Loyal Minto dollars, and each week for eight weeks, a spirit squad went downtown and gave people $10 to thank them for supporting downtown merchants. They also provided people with a locally loyal Minto branded face mask and bag, and they placed signs at the entrances to the community promoting safe shopping experiences. They also had a mask selfie contest and a monthly draw of $100 in gift certificates from Think Minto First. And they created Minto Strong videos to showcase how local business owners are our neighbors. In Prince George, British Columbia, the municipality partnered with 10 other organizations to launch the Support PG website and ad campaign, which acts as both a centralized information portal and a means to promote local and touring local. They also launched Titan Talk Zoom calls, which included business titans from the retail and restaurant industry speaking about how they had pivoted as a result of COVID-19 with time for callers to ask advice from the titans. While businesses and rural economic development practitioners have responded to the impacts in a number of innovative ways, our survey results show that there is still a lot of uncertainty over how optimistic rural economic development practitioners are about economic recovery, especially over the next year. As the impacts of COVID-19 continue to deepen, adopting place-based approaches will be critical to support rural recovery and resilience. More specifically, we need immediate, medium, and long-term plans, programs, policies, and investments in key areas like broadband, social infrastructure, climate resilience, new governance arrangements, and an economic development that builds community capacity to respond and manage future opportunities and challenges. In May, we made the following recommendations to senior levels of government to support rural recovery and resilience. First, senior government should include rural expertise and planning, all response and recovery efforts, including economic recovery task force initiatives. Second, senior government should apply a rural lens when developing or adapting policies, programs, legislation, and or other government practices related to COVID-19 to ensure that rural voices are captured and accounted for. Senior government should also fund, collect, and analyze data on rural Canada to ensure evidence-based policy development, program design, and evaluation related to COVID-19. Fourth, senior government should provide rural specific economic recovery and stimulus funding. More specifically, this might include accelerating investments in broadband, creating a digital adoption program to get people, communities, and businesses online, providing targeted support for rural nonprofits and voluntary organizations, creating a rural recovery plan fund, providing capacity support to turn shovel worthy projects into shovel ready projects considering alternative program delivery models and applications, and restructuring revenue generation and sharing with municipalities. And finally, all senior governments across Canada have individuals and resources on the ground in rural regions, both within government and beyond. These individuals should be involved in strategic policy design and, prov and program delivery to enhance recovery efforts. I strongly believe we are at a crossroads. We can use COVID-19 as an opportunity to forge a new path that invests in long-term resilience or we can let COVID-19 deepen the inequalities that exist across Canada and around the world between people and places. For more information on rural Canada and COVID-19, please visit the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. And I'd like to sincerely thank an amazing team of graduate students, Camilla Bravo, Daniel de Pratsid, Emma Stuck, and Nana de Tim, who worked with me over the summer on this project as part of their capstone in the Masters of Economic Development and Innovation Program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Nick, we're very excited to hear about the work with the Public Health Agency of Canada. And so I'll pass it over to you now. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, Charmaine. And 
thank you for inviting me to take part today uh, in this talk. I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, uh, the modelling work that we've been doing within the Public Health Agency of Canada and with partners. Um, can you see the presentation okay? Yes. Good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, modelling, which is uh, a combination of really two different types of modelling, forecasting, uh, which is um, uh, statistical forecasting. So uh, what did we have in the last few weeks and what are we going to have uh, in the next week or so as a, if uh, we stay within the same kind of pattern of, uh, of epidemic? But then there's the more complicated dynamical modelling, which is um, uh, mathematical modelling, uh, which are models that produce uh, uh, a mathematical kind of uh, uh, presentation or of the uh, of, of the dynamics of transmission of the virus uh, in the public amongst the, the population, and the outputs of these models are for strategic planning and public health planning, what public health measures to to um, uh, to use. Also, situational awareness. So, particularly with the forecasting and and some importation modelling that I'll touch on, um, and uh, public health risk assessments and uh, public health programmes such as vaccination and uh, assessing risks of gatherings and so on. Um, we have an internal modelling group um, of uh, uh, of modellers uh, from the agency, um, and. Um, we, uh, which comprises the the, the modellers themselves, but also a team of uh, uh, of epidemiologists with expertise in knowledge synthesis to identify the um, uh, uh, um, literature uh, which feeds the development of the models and parameters of the models. We have an external uh, expert modelling group who supports what we're doing. There's 94 non-FAC members who meet twice a week. Um, the work of, is to validate what we're doing, um, also to do work similar to us to make sure that there's not great differences um, in what people are, are predicting, um, and to uh, support and enhance our capacity, and also to provide a network of support for provinces and territories that might not have limit, uh, might have limited resources or specific needs that can be supported by academics and uh, people in other government arms. Um, we have a secret secretariat. We also participate in uh, external groups, the WHO COVID modeling group, which meets twice a week, uh, sorry, to, uh, every two weeks, and the Chief Science Advisors uh, modeling group, which meets uh, occasionally. We've had five main uh, uh, objectives for the work we're doing, and these are uh, by and large chronological. The first is modeling scenarios to show the high level impact of public health measures. Uh, as second is to inform um, uh, the public health measures that need to be in place while we're lifting those uh, restrictions that uh, Catherine was talking about, which are so uh, kind of, uh, and others have talked about, which is so um, uh, uh, undesirable. Um, uh, early warning analysis and forecasting. So, where are we actually? Providing guidance, I'm afraid, on how to best re-implement closures to actually control things when they get out of control. And lastly, vaccine strategies. And the last I'm not going to talk about because it's very much a work in progress. The models we're using, as I said, they are a mathematical representation of transmission amongst the public. And by and large, they're those compartment models that are um, uh, susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered or died and uh, there are they're modified to um, uh, to be uh, be able to model transmission of covid specifically with having uh, pre-infectious um, uh, asymptomatic um, uh, and uh, throughout infection asymptomatic um, uh, compartments and also to be able to mo model those three Things we have have in our public health toolbox in the in in the uh, absence of, um, uh, of of effective antivirals and vaccines. So those things are the physical distancing, keeping people apart, keeping either everyone apart from one another, or keeping individual people apart. Those who are ex infected 
away from those who are not yet infected. Then there is um, uh, the, uh, uh, as part of that process, case detection, finding people who are sick and putting them in isolation, and then find out who they've been in contact with uh, and uh, tracing them and asking them to go into quarantine. So there's three groups of public health measures. We've developed three different models of, of, uh, of differing uh, complexity. Um, and as I mentioned, they're either the, all the different parameters are either obtained by fitting to data or from uh, those literature scans. The first thing that we did earlier on was to model scenarios of what might happen under different with different public health effort. And I think this is the um, a, a kind of a very a uh, worrying moment for all of us when we realized just uh, what a, a real challenge this uh, bug was going to have. Um, without controls, it would run through uh, a very high proportion of the population. It has, as we know, um, uh, a, a great capacity for transmission, and yet at the same time, a concerning le uh, level of mortality and uh, a morbidity associated with it, a need for hospital care, and has the great uh, possibility of absolutely uh, completely swamping um, our medical systems. And so we, uh, with a bit of public health m effort, we can kind of flatten the curve, but just simply flattening the curve means that the epidemic is longer and slightly lower, but still we're, um, we are, uh, um, uh, the, our, our public health um, uh, our health systems would be completely swamped. And it's only with a high degree of public health uh, intervention were we able to, uh, would we keep um, our hospitals open? As we know, um, we by and large, by summer, we managed to, um, to achieve this particularly in the um, uh, in, in the Atlantic provinces and uh, uh, obviously in the territories um, and um, uh, but we got the epidemic down to a pretty low level in most of the rest of Canada but obviously things have changed and between kind of March and uh, uh, recently and still ongoing is we're modeling what happens when we remove those uh, restrictive closures um, and people start to come into contact with one another again and start to transmit infection, what are the alternative uh, levels of different uh, public health measures that have to be in place? Um, as I mentioned, the control by and large was down to the um, uh, across the board reduction of rates of contact between people, um, uh, which are uh, very, go, goes against what we are as a, a social species. Um, so very difficult to deal with, uh, uh, particularly for long periods. And, uh, but once we lift those and start to lift those, how much of those other public health interventions have to be in place? So the detection of cases and isolating them and contact tracing and things like wearing masks and, and other um, uh, um, interventions that when we meet, we don't transmit the disease quite as easily. Um, so these graphs, um, are, you'll see a number of them. These come from the, uh, the agent-based model, which is a stochastic model. Uh, you'll see the bottom axis is the uh, time through to October here. Um, uh, the green bar indicates the time period where we had restricted closures in place. The black graph line shows the median of, uh, of a number of simulations, of about 100 simulations, which we use because the model has got stochastic elements, random elements. Uh, that uh, um, uh, allow us to look at uh, a, a kind of ranges of values when we haven't got a precise value. And if you can see as on the left hand side, there's a graph which shows what we hope for, which is that with lifting restrictions, we would have enough testing and tracing in place in order to control the epidemic. In the middle, 
we see that in some simulations that with the, the, the parameters for, uh, um, uh, for for public health interventions that we have, there was not enough. And in some cases, the epidemic takes off again. And the right indicates that while we're talk, talking about, oh, we're in a second wave, we're not, we're all still in the first wave. And we've just been keeping that wave, first wave at bay by virtue of our public health measures. And as you can see, it can come back uh, if we get it wrong um, and uh, and come back to be really disastrous for us. We've been modeling what are the most risky openings, which is turning it on its head, what are the, uh, uh, the best things to shut down? And the essence to that is that, um, uh, that all of the kind of classes of, of meeting contact places um, uh, will have an effect, um, and that includes schools and universities, um, uh, essential workplaces, uh, and bars and restaurants and, uh, and other meeting places uh, as well. And uh, I guess the choice between them is a societal one rather than necessarily a public health one. We've, uh, as I mentioned, we use a number of models. We're using kind of multi-model approaches in a similar way that we do with uh, uh, kind of climate change, uh, climate models for climate change. And in this graphic, it's showing uh, the combinations of case detection and contact tracing that have to be in place as we open up and increase the average number of contacts we have a day from less than six pre-opening to about eight with uh, uh, businesses opening and then to about 10 when we open up bars and restaurants and it will be 12 a day on average if we opened up uh, completely and you can see that as we open up the com combinations of the proportions of contacts of cases that we detect and contacts trace that allow us to remain uh, uh, keep the, the epidemic under control get fewer and fewer as we open up. In other words, we've got to really be, have a high proportion of cases detected and contacts traced in order to keep the epidemic under control. And the more we open up, there's a possibility that even then we might not control the epidemic. And again, this uh, shows uh, a number of combinations. Um, I think the essence here is that uh, top left is that we don't do anything. Top right is that we do a very bad job. Uh, um, uh, bottom left is that um, what we do with what would be expected uh, of public health and able to test and trace, but even then you still get some uh, 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 transmission and some resurgence of epidemics without the public um, uh, being able to uh, participate as well and reduce their contacts, keep their contacts to a minimum, in which case we maintain control. We've been doing the same modeling, modeling the importation of cases, and we're constantly updating this as things, the landscape of that changes, and redoing this uh, with uh, imported cases, and as you can see, you, you end up with more cases. But the essence is the same. Uh, we need a high proportion of cases, to, of, of cases detected, contacts traced, and with the involvement of the public in reducing their contacts as well. This early warning, uh, we're looking, of course, day by day at RT values. We're looking at using social media for forecasting. Um, we are doing statistical short range forecasting and using models more, um, which are hybrids that uh, are looking at the data um, uh, that are uh, uh, um, that we are using for statistical forecasting and fitting mo dynamic models to those uh, that produce forecasts and also allow us to explore forecasts with different scenarios for public health measures. We're um, uh, working hard at the moment to understand how best to re-implement uh, closures. Uh, the essence essentially is that we uh, have to, if we have to shut things down again, we have to shut things down again. If that's the only way that we can control the epidemic, then otherwise our uh, hospitals and ICU will be swamped again. Um, and if we, it is better that we uh, act 
swiftly when we make decide that that has to that has to happen. Uh, the more that uh, we delay, the more cases, the more chance that ICU and hospitals are going to be uh, swamped. And also, the longer we will then have to remain in lockdown or in some kind of shutdown or some kind of closure uh, before we open uh, up again. And so that has worse effects on the economy potentially than uh, a short and hard lockdown. And lastly, we're communicating the results as best we can. Um, uh, these are complicated issues and are difficult issues for uh, the public to understand, respond to without being afraid of what might happen. Um, and we're doing this by via uh, communications to our, a number of tables, uh, the public chief public health officer presentations, and also disseminating the work that we've done in a kind of easy to digest version through the National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Nick, and thanks to all our panelists. For uh, our attendees, a reminder that uh, the session closes at 1.15, and there are very many questions that have been posted in the chat line. So what we'll do is we'll try to address one question per speaker and then um, provide answers to the other questions afterwards. And I want to start with Catherine. Um, and Catherine, um, there are several questions in there for you about trust, but one of the questions uh, talks about um, a couple of items. Given the global extent of this um, pandemic, how do you develop ca communication strategies for a vast number of populations with different kinds of mindsets and challenges? And it's related to another question, so I'll put them together. With respect to building trust within communities, how does one go about doing so if the community is resistant to change? Um, if the individuals within a community deny that there is a serious issue? So uh, both, of course, are great questions. And as you say, Vice President Dean, they're related to each other. So um, I think maybe the maybe we'd take them one at a time, but quickly. The first is developing, you almost answered your own question and asking it. How do you develop communication strategies for a vast number of populations one at a time? It just takes time. It turns out that people need to be reached where they are and who they are and how they are. And so um, this is about really mobilizing an enormous number of people and brains and thoughts and outreach to do that. Um, and again, going back to the Ebola examples, you know, we had, speaking of resistance, so this is getting on to the next question, we had a community of people in one of the villages in, in Guinea who attacked and killed the the health workers who came in at the beginning of the Ebola response. And, you know, it was it was such a resistant, I mean, we talk about resistance, that was such a resistant moment. And we ended up having to tailor a response to that exact village and those exact people in that exact circumstance. But doing so was so valuable because it turned out they had a reservoir of three or four people who had Ebola one was asymptomatic for a period of time, and so it was moving around. So it, it was, I think the question here is, it's an order of <laughs> more difficult than you might think. We really have to be, uh, we, what we need is local action. If we had local, say, county level public health, really functional, really working and really capacitated, then you would have community level public health workers and I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a second, but, you know, it reminds me of when I was in public health school, one of my colleagues was a nurse who started her career as a public health nurse. And what LA County did was they gave her a car and her whole job was to drive around LA County and just go to people's houses and communities and find things like walking TB cases and make sure people were okay and know everybody in her unit and know everybody where she was living. And that's the kind of shoe leather epidemiology and public health 
that's going to be essential to bring people on board. You need people from your community who know and understand you to be the ones that are helping to communicate. And so it's a, it's a giant job, but it's one we've done for other things. We eradicated smallpox and we did it exactly the same way. And we're working on polio. So it's not impossible, it's just hard. Yeah, I understand. Very good comments. I mean, the, the local aspect is so important. This ties into Heather's conversation. Um, there are a number of questions for Polinio and Bernie Dunker, our Associate Vice President, um, interdisciplinary research and the co-architect of this session. May I ask you to pick a question for Polinio? Sure. So this one comes from the Q&A. Uh, so Plinio, you made very clear that you work with aggregate data, not individual data. However, the public may not distinguish between aggregate and their own information. Do you think this is part of the firewall that you're experiencing? Uh, definitely. Like this is uh, with our partnership with with Equip. Oh, sorry. Am I muted? No, I'm not. So excellent. So yes, the answer is uh, definitely. Like we we've been working with Equip for quite a while. And uh, one of the greatest barriers to joining that program is this perception that uh, their privacy would be exposed, right? And uh, the, the, the way around it is that we need to build a, like an organization, like a not-for-profit uh, institution with a number of different uh, representatives on the board to create the, uh, the necessary trust so that users understand that their data will never be, be exposed. Right, like if you look at uh, so what Stats Canada does these days, right, like your data, whenever it's collected by Stats Canada, is available to researchers, just protected by the protocols that need to be in place to make sure that they will never re-identify you, right? So it's that the biggest challenge right now is that public perception, and that is one of the greatest barriers to to accessing some of this data. However, on the technical side, the the companies often uh, prefer to maintain their data protected behind these firewalls because they are afraid of litigation. So in order to make sure that they're, they're, they're complying with what, they're, what their clients want, they make it more difficult for researchers to access it at, in an aggregate level. Absolutely interesting challenge, thanks. Thank you, Plinio, and thank you, Leslie, for the question. So Nick, um, as a similar question to uh, Catherine's, but maybe in a different spirit, Catherine talked about working in the local communities being so important in order to build trust and tailoring things to each local community. And I guess I wanna ask a, a question about coordination. So at the public health agency level, you're developing models uh, and predictions and using those in order to drive strategy at the federal level. I wonder if you could talk about how this rolls out at each provincial level and if it's, is it, um, you know, how are they connected? How do you, how do you make sure that each province is uh, having some level of coordination with the others in terms of modeling and what the models are saying, or is it up to, uh, you know, each region to work? How, how do you pull that all together? Well, I, don't, I think the, um, uh, I had a, a discussion with a, um, uh, uh, a, uh, a modeler from uh, a university uh, out west, uh, and who, say, who said, "Well, um, what are you guys doing?" And a similar kind of vein with this, I think, belief that. Uh, well, actually, she said she uh, assumed that we have a kind of like you know a bit of a team of modelers for each province, and the um, in fact the, we had three modelers. So um, at the start of this, um, uh, and and so we're we're not going to do modelling for other people. We're going to do it for a for the country as a whole, and to to create um, uh, um, to create um, the uh, uh, a, a knowledge about what possible scenarios could be when we. And as you know, we've built uh, a, a, a very large external modeling group now. We've brought together people. There is modeling skill within um, uh, many of the provinces um, that has been brought on board within those provinces. And within that external group, we also make sure that it is a kind of sorting house for 
uh, uh, provinces and territories that don't have um, uh, modeling skill that within their province that they can reach down to that they can be supported. When it comes to coordination, well, the, the coordination that happens essentially is at our external uh, modeling group meeting. And um, uh, in general, it is in terms of, uh, in two ways. One is in terms of, of making sure that we're all on the same page and the models are saying the same thing and we're not uh, producing uh, outcomes that are conflicting, meaning that one or other of the models is incorrect. Um, and basically that's happened and everyone is on the same page. And that's in terms of basic principles. What would happen if the epidemic, uh, if we did this and what would happen if we go, if we did that, would it be better or worse? When it comes down to modeling within a particular location, then almost modeling has to happen at a community level because it, what happens to the epidemic within a particular community um, is, um, uh, is, is not something that can be represented by a model that aims to look at a very huge population. So, um, uh, and there are, uh, there is efforts to make sure that there are, there are mo modeling methods that can be applied to smaller communities, to smaller sections, and to make sure that the, the people have access to those. So, that is the kind of coordination um, uh, that we do. However, we are, do have a, also a crosstalk between uh, two important tables. One is the Technical Advisory Committee, which is the federal, provincial and territorial uh, lead epidemiologists. Um, and the second is the Senior Advisory uh, Committee, which is the, um, uh, the essentially the chief medical officers of health of Canada of all the provinces and territories. And, uh, and we now have a regular kind of uh, um, uh, uh, discussion uh, about uh, modeling needs and uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Nick. So very much in alignment with Catherine then. Um, overall coordination, but very much needs the local level in order to drive an understanding of, of epidemic modeling and also trust and what needs to be done. Very interesting. Bernie, I think you've been mod um, monitoring the questions for Heather. Um, could you pull one out for us? Absolutely. So Heather, here's one from the chat. Have any rural communities partnered with neighboring communities to pool resources in order to respond more effectively to their common needs regarding the impact of COVID-19? Great question. Certainly, we've seen a number of rural communities, especially here in southern Ontario, where we do have the county structure. Um, and so that allows a predetermined kind of governance arrangement that allows these partnerships to happen. But we saw some um, county governments kind of provide the emergency line that people could call and then they would direct that out to the underlying municipalities. We saw communities come together to pool either funding or resources staff to be able to respond to some of the challenges in their broader regions. Um, we're also seeing in some communities, especially that have neighboring indigenous communities, trying to work together to ensure that the communities stay safe and working with indigenous partners to see what they need in terms of support and either managing people coming into the community or assisting uh, with that. So lots of opportunities to partner across, across the country. Great to hear, thanks. So I'll, I'll put a last question on the table, and um, it was directed towards Catherine. And uh, you know, it's um, you know there there are so many facets to it that it can be addressed by everybody here. Um, you know, it starts off by saying thanks for a pre wonderful presentation. You mentioned how important it is that public health continue communicating with the public and regularly repeating their message throughout the pandemic. Um, could you comment on the impact that there has been to public health trust as messages change or are revised, especially since we are seeing pandemic fatigue and people ignoring public health guidance? How does public health continue to maintain public's trust um, by keeping public health guidance on top of mind for all of us 
as we work towards ongoing protection. So uh, we'll take this as a last question and I'm happy Catherine and um, uh, maybe another another participant to uh, take a stab at answering it. Yeah, so I'll give it a go, but I think everybody here probably has um, some interesting contribution to this. <clears throat> you know, it reminds me, um, one of my first jobs was uh, as an assistant teacher in a third grade class. It was a long, long, long time ago, but we were working on math. And it, it reminds me that there were 35 kids in the class at the time. And one of the things that this very wise teacher told me was sometimes I actually have to think of 35 different ways to teach exactly the same thing. And I think that the job right now is the, as I was saying at the beginning, the, the epidemiology and the answer to how to stop or prevent or maintain or hold COVID back, it's not complicated, right? Wear a mask, wash your hands, stay physically distant. Um, and we all know it. Uh, you know, a friend of mine who came into the uh, Ebola situation said, every man, woman, child, and dog knows how not to pass on Ebola. The problem isn't the knowledge of how not to pass it on. The question is, how do we reach people? And it's our job as public health experts. It's our job as local uh, leaders. It's our job as individuals. It's our job as family members to figure out how to say it differently. Just like that teacher in third grade who figured out 35 different ways to help kids learn times tables. You know, it's our job to figure out as many ways as we need to, to reach people and make that messaging work. It is hard. It is slow. And there will always be, you know, areas that we don't reach. I mean, if you think about, you know, even the vaccines, which we didn't even get into here, so I'm not going to, I don't mean to open a door into a whole other, you know, world of questions. But if you think about vaccine reach, we've had stable vaccines for measles and things like this, and we, we don't have global population coverage. And it's because you can reach 90% of people. We're not reaching 90% right now with COVID. We need to do better and we need to be creative. It's kind of the job now. We're all exhausted. There's a lot of fatigue and it's it's still time to do better than we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. Anyone else wants to contribute to that? Yes, I would just like to follow up briefly on that. One of the one of the biggest issues that we're seeing right now is that we are all dealing with this pandemic and all the initiatives that are out there are, out there, out there are trying to solve this with a single solution, single message to the entire population. And that doesn't work. We need to learn how to tailor these interventions and target specific subgroups of the population. Because going back to what Catherine just mentioned, like everybody knows what the rules are, but very few people actually understand the concept of bubbles, for example, and the fact that they cannot meet with like people that are meeting with are part of other bubbles as well. And consequently, that is one of the main uh, vectors for disseminating the same COVID-19 right now. Right? So, so one of the issues, in my opinion, is making this message more customized to different subsets of the population and making sure that people understand the messaging that we're trying to convey. Thank you, Plenio. I think we're going to have to wrap this up now. It's 1.15. Listen, so thrilled to have you, Catherine, uh, Plenio, Heather, and Nick. What wonderful presentations today. Thank you so much for joining us. There are several questions that we didn't get to answer, but we will answer them and we will try to reach everyone who's asked questions uh, by sending back information to you or posting it on our Research Talks website. Uh, a special thank you to Janet and, and uh, Bernie and the team for putting this on, John Cressman. And again, thank you to our special guests and presenters and to everybody who's participated to here. Look forward to having you at uh, subsequent research talks. Thanks again, everyone, for being here today. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. It was really, really a privilege. Thank you, Catherine. It was a great pleasure.